Hi, I'm Kathy Tomba. I'm a parent coach, and I work with parents who are concerned about their son or daughter's substance use. Today, I'm very excited to talk to Dr. Rob Kelly. Dr. Rob Kelly works with people who are concerned about their own addiction issues and other traumas. Here is some more information about Dr. Kelly and his work in the field of addiction. Dr. Rob Kelly, PhD, is a sought-after recovery expert who believes in treating the causes of addiction and not the symptoms. Dr. Kelly has appeared on such shows as The Doctors, Eye Opener, Good Morning Texas, and Ken's Five Morning News. A frequent contributor to radio and print interviews, including The Jim Bohannon Show, Miracles in Recovery USA, Today, and participated in McLean's Hospital's Harvard Medical School's study on the stigma associated with mental illness. Dr. Kelly hosted Sober Celeb Show on KLIF Radio in Dallas and currently hosts the Breaking Through Addiction podcast featuring special guests discussing a variety of mental health issues. So welcome, Dr. Kelly. We're very happy to have you here. Thank um, you, so Kathy. And there's so much more to share, but can you briefly tell us, you know, your story, how you came into wanting to work with people with addiction issues and those kinds of things? Sure. Hi, guys. Great to meet you. Mm -hmm. um, I'm a chronic alcoholic is where it all started for me. Came from an alcoholic family, took my first drink at the age of nine on stage in Liverpool on a Friday evening was my first drink of alcohol. Um, and as far as I was concerned, it was the best thing I'd ever done. This liquid, because I was nervous on the first part of the the the, uh, the, the stage, and he'd come off for a break, went on for another forty five minutes, and of course my uncle gave me a beer real quick, and uh, that was it. I was on stage, it was amazing, and that set off my life, but it also set off my alcoholism. One of the problems with being back home in England, just in case you thought I was from South Texas, guys, I'm actually from <laughs> Manchester in England, uh, is nobody knew about alcoholism. Nobody wanted to know. Um, everyone thought it was about the alcohol. It was crazy. So I get turned down and turned down and go to AA or NA or, you know, all the 12 step groups, but I just couldn't find any help. So eventually through the years, <clears throat> it really got a grip of me. So I uh, getting married, had two children, thought it'd stop me drinking. Didn't still didn't think I had a problem. Just I drank a little bit too much. When you're walking around the garden or the yard guys, uh, 5 30 in the morning drinking your first bottle of vodka you would think that would be a giveaway but no it wasn't for me so I kept drinking drinking and then uh, eventually I uh, I was coming downstairs one day in the middle of the morning sorry and I'm uh, looking for vodka my, my wife found it and she snatched it off me and I stabbed her three times because she won't let me finish my vodka um, and this is my past guys you know I, i've got to say it because it's my past i try not to hide anything from the past that i've done anyway i fled to spain because i was going to be arrested for uh, attempted murder or something and i came back only when she would uh, sign with the attorney to make sure that i was not going to get arrested and um, it's different in the uk than it was here you know if uh, police are called to you know a house with a couple here someone's going to jail uh, back home, if they don't want to press charges, there's nothing you can do about it. So I came back, and then when the day I got back, she left and she took my children. Uh, and then after that, shortly after that, uh, I became homeless. We separated. I went to my mom and dad. They threw me out after three days. Went to friends, from friends to acquaintances, and then from acquaintances to the streets. And I lived on the streets for 14 months back in Manchester. Cold, freezing, raining, snow. I would beg for money to buy alcohol or I would steal alcohol and, and that was my life. You know, seven suicide attempts uh, and on two occasions they worked. My heart stopped and I was pronounced dead and they brought me back to life. The EMDRs did, uh, sorry, EM, the, what do you call them over here? They call them ambulance men in the UK, EMTs, brought mm -hmm. me back to life and uh, on I went, you know. And then one morning, um, I was walking around the not so populated area of Manchester where the factories are and I dropped down to my hands and knees. I started crying like a baby <clears throat> from my stomach. Not because I'd lost my children, wife, cars, money, but I was crying because the first time in my life I realised I couldn't stop drinking. 
I looked up to the sky and I said, if there's a God up there, I can't do this on my own anymore. And a guy walked around the corner in the middle of nowhere. He had a little Bible in his hand. His name was Derek. And he took me back to his house. And that is where my journey started. Amazing. And it's always, I mean, you hear the stories and you want to tell parents, you know, that there's so much hope for, you know, no matter how far into this drug use or alcohol use that their children are, that there is hope. And when you hear stories like yourself, it's, they're so true uh, because it's hard to see, I think, for parents too, when they, and I work for with, a lot with parents. So one of the things that comes up for me a lot is that when I talk to parents, I've heard so many times that my children are musical, they play an instrument, they want to record. And I saw on your information that you are musical and you played with quite a few very you know, uh, well-known groups. Um, so tell me a little bit about that. Do you feel, I, I, we, we know addiction does, you know, anyone can have in it substance use issues. And I do understand that, but do you feel like there's certain groups like musicians who tend to fall into this more often, or what is your take on that? Well, I was, I, I, play, I was a session bass player at Abbey Road at the age of 17. Um, I was only introduced to drugs when I was there. So the music industry is prone uh, for drinking and using, obviously. Now, if you're not, alcoholics are born. So it's a predisposition passed down from generation. Drug addicts are not. Drug addicts are made. So they have the addictive personality, take the first drug, i.e. pain med from a doctor, and they end up in my office after spending a year on heroin. Uh, that's the usual deal. So. There's certain industries where it's really hard, like if you was a barman or a waitress at a restaurant, but you are trying not to drink. I mean, obviously, don't put yourself in them situations until you're ready. Uh, but yeah, it, you know, the, the musicians of this world and the artists, they seem to suffer a little bit more than the others. I've worked with all A-listers, footballers, movie stars, musicians, actors, whatever they are. We've, we've worked with the best of the best. And it, the, the artistic ones, I don't know, it, it just seems, and, and nobody's asked me that question. So when I'm thinking about it now, it's really intriguing that they seem to suffer. Now, I know the guys I used to hang around with, the famous musicians, they just had time on their hands, so they abused alcohol and drugs. Why wouldn't you at an early age? I think that, uh, yeah, definitely. For me, when I was in the studio, uh, I was so tired sometimes because I'd go to college, you know, during the day and at nighttime when they did their sessions, so nobody mobbed them going through the door. Um, I would take cocaine to keep me awake and I'd probably get two hours sleep and I'd do the same thing all over again the next day. That makes sense. Um, the hours and all of that too. And I see too, I think when, when I think of high school or middle school age, it's those kids that are athletic, that people tend to, you know, put on a pedestal and it's yeah. the ones that are more artistic. And so I, I kind of see that too, where they're just sort of pushed on the sideline, maybe a disappointment to their parents or whatever. I mean, even if the parents don't really feel that way. So anyway, good. Thank you for that insight. <clears throat> so families are often told to let go of their kids, let them hit rock bottom or kick them out of the house. Um, other people, other approaches tell families to stay close. We know that, you know, different methods work for different people. But what can families, especially parents, do, in your opinion, to help their son or daughter change and get healthy? Um, what do parents need to understand and how can they support their kids? Like in my program, I'm wondering if, you, or excuse me, not in my program, in your program, I'm wondering if your families are part of the solution at all, but you have a, a, a line of stepping into the solution. So I'm just wondering what your thoughts about that are with parents and how they can help. So th there's a fine line, obviously, which I'll explain in a second, but the interesting part we've done over the 30 years is we, we've, we've looked at families. If an alcoholic, whoever that may be, man or wife, comes to us um, and their family or wife doesn't want to come on board, then we won't take the patient. Because when a family is involved with the recovery, the, the, the recovery rate of the, of the alcoholic goes up by 42%. So we're halfway there. We know that's why we have a 97% success rate, unheard of. We're missing the family out, guys. You know, the it's a family illness and it's also a family recovery. So the way I state it is, let's say you have two houses, you have the family house and you have us over here. So we go to this guy and we pick him out and we put him in our place. Recovery has its own language. So let's say this house speaks Chinese. We take him out, we put him into our place and we teach him English. We teach him English for three months. 
And then what we do is we pick him up, we put him back into the Chinese speaking house. And what's going to happen? He's going to start speaking Chinese, obviously. So they both need to know this different language. Now, the flip side of that is my, my dad threw me out when I promised not to drink after a marriage to split up. I had nowhere to go. And uh, I did. And he was told by an old sponsor of mine to throw me out. Now, that was the best thing he ever did. I've got to admit that. And it's funny though, Kathy, because many years later when I'm having a cup of tea with my mom and dad was at the bar and I said, do you remember that time you threw me out, mom? And she went, yeah. I said, I hated that man and I still do today for that. And this is what she said to me. She said, listen, Rob, in 52 years of being married to your father, that's the only time I've seen him cry. And it really hit me, you know? So if, if the person, son, daughter, wife, husband is calling, causing mayhem in the house, if there's violence in the house, then you need to get you need to get another house. You need to change the locks and you need to let him find his own way. 90% uh, of those people will be okay. But you can't live under them circumstances and conditions because other, we've tested and tried loads and loads of ideas, loads of thought patterns around uh, the alcoholic and addict. And uh, we did some tests on people coming back from Iraq and housewives living in the home with a husband that's a chronic alcoholic who was violence every night. And the brain pertaining to the trauma was exactly the same as a soldier coming back from war as the woman in the house with a violent alcoholic husband. So we have to be really careful you know, like I say, the fine line, if they're causing trouble, been arrested, whatever it is, you, you need to push them away. Because the, the, there's a fine point again between if, if my parents found me in the bedroom dead, whose, whose fault is it? Well, it's obviously mine, but it's my parents as well, because they enabled me to continue drinking. Now, I was ill, I was sick. There's no way was I stopping drinking. I couldn't. So the neuroscience behind that, in case you're thinking, guys, if you're listening to this and there is a son or daughter or husband or wife involved, the three parts of the brain that differ in the alcoholic's brain than anybody else. One of them is the hypothalamus. It's our fight or flight part of the brain. It tells us to eat, water, eat, eat food and drink water to survive. That's why we never have to teach babies that they need to eat. Fingers down its mouth, crying because its tummy hurts. What happens to the alcoholic at a certain point of their drinking career like me, it turns around and tells the alcoholic to drink alcohol only. That's why we can go days or weeks without, out, without food or water. So when something like that happens, you also have to become a sick person. You know, we're not bad people getting good, we're sick people trying to get well. Now, the understanding of that alone, it's really hard to throw one of your children out. So dialogue. Dialogue, 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 guys, around this. And phone somebody, call somebody um, that you can talk to. Because there's times when you will, and there's times when you can't. Thank you. That's excellent. That's great information. Um, and so kind of tailgating on that, um, harm reduction. What are your thoughts on harm reduction? Do you feel it's helpful? Do you think it has a place in recovery? How do you approach that? Uh, definitely. I think anything... Any, I mean, the harm reduction goes from, um, you know, going on to boxing to, you know, cutting and, and, and stuff like that. Anything we can pull away as we get, as we're getting better helps. So harm reduction, uh, suboxone is classed as harm reduction because uh, we're tapering off a certain drug. And I agree with that. I'm all in for that. The only thing I'm not in for is continuous use of uh, the, the suboxone and, and the other stuff that uh, drug addicts are using out there and some for alcohol. It's a taper only. If you're on that for more than four weeks, there's something wrong. So harm reduction, information, what we do, how we tell it, what we use to come off a certain drug, the conditions and surroundings are very, very important to us because alcoholics have what they call childhood trauma and addicts to the worst. So everybody has childhood trauma. If, if you're sat there going, well, I don't know too much. I, everybody has childhood trauma, but we have to define what that trauma is to that person. So trauma to one person might be a car accident where mom died. Trauma to another person was dad saying, how many times have I told you you can't go to college because you're not clever enough? Both them scenarios could end in suicide if not treated. So we, we've gone in depth with trauma, family trauma and childhood trauma. And for us, it's the gateway drug. It really is the gateway drug. You know, that this is where it all comes from.
how, how I act, feel, do today is, is a correlation right down here to when I was a child. I got taught how to speak, how not to speak, how to act, and all of a sudden I'm doing something here that goes right back to here. Thank you for that. Perfect. Okay. And I know, you know, there's so many different approaches and, you know, I think sometimes it's, hard. you know, you wish I hear often, what's the silver bullet? And there is no silver bullet. So, um, all right. So your website offers quite extensive options for services. One thing I noticed about you, Rob, is that you bring a sense of humor into this. I was looking at some of your videos and different things and it's such a difficult topic. And I thought, oh, I just love that, you know, you're bringing some humor into it. Uh, we want, of course, we all need to be sensitive, especially, you know, we know families are really struggling. But uh, aside from that, so can you just tell us about what you offer, how you can help a person, um, how, what, you know, a little bit more about the work you're doing and how people can live healthier lives with your so assistance? We kind, of, we kind of a different company, and this is why we have such a high success rate, is because we're not treating the symptom, we're not treating the alcohol, drugs, depression, childhood trauma, we're treating what's actually going on. Because alcohol has 1% to do with alcoholism, the same with drugs, the same with food, sex, porn, whatever it may be. It's the mind, it's all, I didn't have a drinking problem, Kathy, I had, I had a thinking problem and alcohol was the symptom I went to every time. So we treat an array of conditions. In fact, I only take on four patients at any one time. My four patients right now, three of them are not alcoholic or drug addicts. They suffer from childhood trauma, lack of confidence, all this stuff. So uh, we believe, truly believe and guarantee, otherwise we will refund your money, the only company in the world that does that, uh, that everybody can recover and everybody has a chance and alcoholics and addicts and depressive people, um, childhood trauma people get two lives in one lifetime. The life they've had so far, which has been caged, traumatic, you know, sickening at sometimes, depressed into this new world, which neuroscience and quantum physics clash, which tell us that we can actually do anything we want to do and be anybody we want to be. Now, six or seven years ago, I used to always, because I used to tell people this, and the, the quick remark back as, as a funny, you know, there you go, Rod, was, was, well, I can't be president of the United States. I beg to differ. Forget your political views for a second. We had a business from running the country with no political experience whatsoever. So don't tell me that you can't do anything you want to do because it is possible. So we treat 30, 40 conditions, because again, it's not about the alcohol, drugs, sex, food, porn, cake. It's about the way I'm thinking, tied to my self-sabotaging neural pathway where the basal ganglia picks up and repeats sabotage all of the time because of childhood trauma. So what we do is we go back, we clear all that up. We call, we call it going back to the scene of the crime. We clear all that up. You find out who you are. Most people listening to this, you don't know your true identity. There's about 20, 30% of people in, in, in America that actually know why they were put on this earth and therefore they're high performers. Everybody has a leadership in them. Everybody has the ability to come from homelessness to I run a multi-million dollar company today. Everybody has, there's nothing special about the guys that are doing what I do, they're not. It's the understanding of how the mind, body, central nervous system works and how we let fear which is based on the past and anxiety in the front. So I explain to people that babies are born. We're born with only two fears, the fear of falling and the fear of loud noises. The rest are man-made. Wait till your father gets home. Oh my God, the bus wants you. It's, it's it, what? It's not, it's not real. So when we take away that fear, all my patients, and we've done about 8,000 people over the last 30 years, not as if we've done a handful, we've been in the, in the trenches working with these people, is pick up the ball and run. You know, pick up the ball and run because I want you to act like a six-year-old kid with a new toy. Because I used to always worry, Kathy, how I looked, you know, is everything okay? Do I, do I, you know, I, 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 nobody cares. And I'll tell you why nobody cares because they've got their own stuff going on. So when you realize that when you walk into a room, not everybody's looking at you, nobody cares who you are, and I'm all nervous and fearful. It's like when you, when you find out that fear's not real, you find your own identity, you clear up your past, your future is gonna be the best days of your life. Now, to emphasize that, a few years ago, my father died and my mom passed away a few years before that, but we went into the house, me and my friend, to clear all the stuff out. And we found these loads of photographs of all the family 
And he come across a photograph of me and him. It was, must have been 19, 20, and we're bodybuilders. And he said, oh my God, Rob, look at this photograph. It was in black and white. It, oh my, and I got it. Oh my God, look how thin we were. Oh God, look how good looking we was. Our waist was small, our arms were big. Oh my God, Jimmy, those were the days. And I thought to myself, you know, we didn't know those, those were the days then. We never stood for a second and thought, wow, I'm actually really attractive. I'm actually really good looking. No, nobody does that. So my question is to you guys, is what if today's one of those days? What if today you turn everything around that you can look back on and go, listen, I heard this crazy English guy on Kathy's show that told me this, but it's so true. Perspective going forward. Today is one of those days, guys, believe me. That's wonderful. Very, you know, I was, and I encourage people to go to your website and watch some of the videos. You are so inspiring. You have so much enthusiasm. It's really, it, I really thought oh, this would be a great place to go to to change your life. I mean, to just really get healthy and feel better about yourself. So interesting. Yeah, very good. That's the important part, Kathy, feeling better about yourself. And like you said, it's such a morbid subject. Everybody wants to look down on alcoholics and addicts. And we don't, we laugh because we know you can recover. We laugh. We, I wear stupid color scrubs with stupid color shoes, pink, orange, blue. Sometimes it's on the same shoe, the colors. I got my hair all spiked, so I don't care. I'm 62, I don't care. So I will bring laughter into this industry. And a lot of people don't like me for it, but hey, this is about saving lives, not being popular. I never I never got off the streets to be where I am today just to be popular, you know? I, I, I'm helping people. And why shouldn't we laugh once you're recovered? Why shouldn't we look at things and say, hey, listen, what happened to me here does not define me today. But what happens in my past becomes my greatest asset. Because when I work with people now, they go, yeah, Dr. Rob, what do you know? You've never been homeless, check. You've never lost your kids, check. You've never, check, 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 check. I've done all this stuff, so it's the greatest asset. Now, my youngest daughter, the, the, the authorities took my daughters off me, ages one and three, uh, and I've never seen my youngest daughter 30 years on. But my eldest daughter, and this is where life takes off, guys. My eldest daughter, after, I don't know, 30 years, she messaged me on, on, on Facebook, God bless Facebook. And it says, hey dad. And I was in the, it was the middle of the night here, it was like three o'clock in the morning, ping and answered it and blurred. I was looking at the phone like, and uh, it said, hey dad, I've just seen you on TV in England. I don't believe what everyone told me about you. I want to meet, I have, I have something to show you. So I called her and we spoke for the first time in 30 years and she called me dad, Kathy. She called me dad mm -hmm. and we, we, while I was speaking to her, my wife was on the phone booking the next flight out and it was like three hours away. We scrambled our stuff, we got there and we flew over there. The next day we was going to a house. So we walked to the house, me and my wife from the hotel around the corner. And just for a second, Kathy, I stood on that door before we rang the bell and all that bad stuff came back to me. What sort of father was you? You were never there for her. All this stuff started to just, come from nowhere and she opened the door which surprised us and we fell into each other and we cried we cried and cried and then and then she says come on i've got something to show you and she walked me into her living room kathy and she handed me my three-month-old granddaughter and that's the stuff that life's made of not the stuff we did in our past not the bad stuff that we don't get judged on that right now you start working the right thing, doing the right thing, helping people, compliment people, saying nice things. When I meet somebody, when I walk away from them, I just want them to smile and go, you know, that guy's crazy. He's funny, but he's crazy. If somebody can leave my presence better for knowing me than not, then that's my job. The rest of the stuff, the TV stuff, the, the books and all that stuff that I, that, that I create over here, it keeps my wife happy and pays the bills and the mortgage. I don't really, I don't get involved in that stuff. I get involved in, how many people, because I believe in God, okay? So when I, I, I open get to them pearly gates, so they say, and I knock on the door and, and, and Peter comes to the door, he's not gonna say, hey Rob, how much are you worth? He's not gonna say that to me. He's not gonna, hey Rob, what was that car like you drove? It looked to me, he's not gonna say that. He's gonna say, how many people did you save? How many lives did you save in your 70 odd years of life that we put on it. And I can honestly turn around and say as many as I could possibly do. Because I could retire now, 
go to a Bahamas somewhere, a small island, probably by the island, and never see a human being again. But that's not my job. God's blessed me with all the stuff around me, yes. But 25% of our work is always pro bono. Every single therapist, every coach must carry a pro bono. And we also have the Rob Kelly Foundation where we collect, obviously, of people that are trying to help and we give back and we pay for detoxes. We pay for, you know, this guy wants his children back, he's got to turn up in court, we'll pay his legal fees, we'll buy him a nice suit to turn up in court with, you know, stuff like that. So I think as long as you're doing that, you're doing the right thing and amazing things will happen. Wonderful. No, it's a wonderful story. And certainly you've, the one thing that's great too, is you have all the training, you have all the professional training, but you've also lived the experience. So you, you've come from tons of resources and information to share. So wonderful. So how can people learn more about you? I know parents are always looking for help uh, for their kids. And uh, do you work with women and men or you just work with men? You work with no, just work with everybody Okay, uh, and trans, everything you want to put in there. Yeah. Uh, my daughter is uh, gay uh, mm -hmm. and we have a particular sort of partner. So whatever it is, we can help. So a couple of things I want to say. First of all, if you're just listening and not watching this, guys, uh, I spell my name with two Bs. R-O-B-B-K-E-L-L-Y dot com is the website. Put Dr. Rob Kelly in any search engine, I'll come up. Um, and the other thing I want to mention is this, that you can call, usually my wife mans the phone, you can call 24 hours a day, parents. You really about your children, okay? And my wife will speak to you 100 times a day if she needs to, two years, three years at a time if she needs to. We just don't want you to be on your own. You wanna start dialogue with us. We're never gonna sell you anything, believe it or not. We're just, we're not we don't do stuff like that. I don't promote nothing on here, uh, but uh, we can help you and, and, and we'd love to help you. But what I really wanna say is, you know, people, People used to say to me, well, put your money where your mouth is kind of thing. You know, you talk this, you know, talk and you've been there. So I always do this. Here's, here's my cell phone number, guys. 214-600-0210. If you're one of them people that are sat at home right now in the place that I used to be, suicidal, never think you're going to amount to anything, never think you're going to be able to do anything in your life, you call me because I'll tell you what I'm going to do. I'm going to give you a 15-minute pep talk that will change your life. And do you know if it doesn't, never happen yet, but if it doesn't, I'll send you a hundred dollars for wasting your time. We're in this together. You can recover, you can come out of that depression, no matter how long you've been in it. And it let our family, which is me, my wife, Janet, my daughter, therapist, she's my lead therapist in Manchester, my cousin, my niece, my sister, my brother-in-law, and two other people that we treat like family. So let our family help your family. Oh, that's amazing. What a wonderful resource. So I am so happy to hear all this. I will have for people watching, um, or this will be, uh, I'll take the high points and put them on an article, but it will be on YouTube and the, all the information, all the links and everything will be listed in both places. So yeah, so you can easily find it. So thank you so much for coming and sharing your story. Uh, you are such an inspiration. Oh my gosh, because I know there's so many parents and families who just feel so hopeless. So it's just nice to see all that you've overcome and how successful you are and your help and you're giving back. It's not just about, like you said, it's not, you know, you're giving back to others. So thank you very much. I really appreciate it. Thank you, Kathy. Bye guys.